Mark wrote, from there, Jesus and his followers went through Galilee. From there. It's a transitional phrase, right? It means that they were somewhere and now they're somewhere different. So physically they are moving in the Gospel of Mark. The disciples and Jesus are always on the move. But you and I also know, whether we've read a lot of comic books or we've watched a lot of movies, we know that there's, there's been a change. Something has happened. Something has happened with their vision. Something has happened with their idea of God. Maybe their idea of themselves. And we have this reading for today, which might make us humble Lutherans feel a little squeamish, a little off. We might be a little offended by the disciples because they are debating amongst themselves who is the greatest. With Jesus standing right there, the gall. What would get him to this point? So we don't really know, to be perfectly clear, and we don't really even know what they're debating, what the greatness means. We're injecting our own interpretation into that. But here they are, in the middle of the Gospel of Mark, chapter 9. They are debating amongst themselves who is the greatest. By the way, when Jesus asks them what they're debating about, of course, they go quiet really quick because they know that this probably isn't an appropriate conversation in front of their teacher. Also in this particular reading, we heard that Jesus was talking about the cross, or what you and I have now realized after 2,000 years of theology and grandmas and grandpas and aunties and uncles and dear saints who have taught us, we know they're talking about the cross. The disciples don't really know that. They don't understand it, and yet they are terrified of Jesus. So we don't know exactly what has happened, and we know that we have the Gospel of Mark, chapter 9, so we have eight chapters of things that have happened, and of course they have seen Jesus do many things. He's healed the sick, he's cast out demons, he's done what Jesus does. So we don't have to cover all of the Gospel of Mark, but we could just go back to the beginning of 9. If you had your Bibles handy, I'd invite you to open them up to chapter 9, we'd go to the very top, and we, cut, we see that at the very beginning of chapter 9, so right before this event, Jesus takes Peter, James, and John, so not all the disciples, but three of the disciples who represent all of the disciples. I guess they're kind of the, the executive committee of the disciples. And he takes them to the top of a mountain. And there they experience what is called the transfiguration, which, by the way, in our worship space, is represented by those three panels over the altar. Jesus in the middle, Moses to the left, to your left, and then Elijah to the right. So we have a whole day in our worship calendar. It's in the winter time where we talk about the transfiguration, but that's in the winter. Why wait till then? Jesus got them up on a mountain. And when they get up on a mountain, they are consumed by clouds. They're absolutely encircled. Their vision is, is hazy, it is blurred, it is dim. They can't really see what's going on, but they can make out Jesus. And then Elijah and Moses appear. In tradition and in scripture, Moses is the bringer of the law, God's word being brought to God's people. Moses, as some of us may also know, he is the one that led the Israelites from enslavement into freedom by God's guiding, by the way, using the cloud. Elijah is the proclaimer of the law. He is the one that enters into the Israelite history when there is great turmoil, and he helps to call the people back to God. So proclaimer of the law and the leader of God's people again. And so here they are on this mountain. And these two profound leaders in the history of the Israelite people and the history of our faith as well, they appear alongside Jesus. And now the disciples know that there's something big going on. And they probably know scripture well enough to know that Moses went up on a mountain one time and God encircled Moses with a cloud so that Moses could not see. And then God speaks. Now the disciples are absolutely clear. There is no doubt. When God speaks, we listen. When God speaks, life happens. When God speaks, the grace is poured out into the world. The disciples are now in the presence of God. They know that this is God. They now know that Jesus is at the very least a reflection of the divine. You and I have moments like this as well. Maybe not to the point of creating a piece of art, but we have all had those moments. Maybe this day you have had a moment where you have been absolutely clear that God is with you. That God is alongside of you. That God is speaking to you. Maybe it was a moment of prayer. Maybe it was a moment of, of despair. Maybe it was a moment of joy, praising, sing, a moment with family, a moment in the garden. But we knew in that moment that God was with us. The disciples know that God is with them. 
moving through Jesus in some way. They can't quite articulate it and it doesn't all make sense the same way it doesn't make sense to you and me. But now they've been in the presence of God. They come down the mountain, Mark tells us, they come down the mountain, they come down into a valley, there's a whole bunch of people, they swarm Jesus, and they tell Jesus that there's a child who is consumed by a demon, and the disciples tried and they failed, they could not cast out that demon, so Jesus goes over there, and then is able to cast out the demon. Now later on, in that same reading, Jesus pulls the disciples aside and says, oh by the way, that one was a little tough, required a little extra prayer. From there, Jesus and his followers went through Galilee. This is what has happened with the disciples right before we get to this moment, right before we get to this time in Scripture where the disciples have the the courage, the arrogance, to debate amongst themselves who is the greatest. They have just been in the presence of God. And now they're wondering amongst themselves who's the best. Or maybe they're debating amongst themselves who is the best compared to the rest of the community. Or maybe they're comparing themselves as a group compared to the community, to the outsiders, to the vulnerable, to the sick, to those who they encounter. But they are creating a comparison. And you and I, we are going to hear this story and we're going to be offended. We're going to be bothered. It doesn't sound right. It doesn't sound like something we should do. And we know, friends that the disciples in the Gospels, and especially the disciples in the Gospel of Mark, they reflect the early church, which means they reflect Trinity Lutheran Church. There is something happening in the disciples that is meant to be a reflection of our relationship with God. We have moments of grace. We have moments of forgiveness. We have moments of divine intervention into our lives. We have borne witness to it. It's why we gather in this space, because we have experienced God and we want to experience God again. We want to sing praises to God. We want to receive God's mercy and compassion into our lives. We want God's grace to flow out into the world so that all people can experience it the same way as us. And we give thanks, and we should give thanks for the greatness of God. And we are human just like the disciples are human. And we will have moments and thoughts in the back of our mind. We may never confess them out loud, but in the presence of God, in our humility, in our our honesty, we confess them to each other and to God, that there are moments that when we experience the nearness of God, there will be a thought in our minds, or maybe going down the road later that day, we will have a thought in our mind that we, because God is moving with us and in, with, and under us, that we are right with God, which is good and correct, and then we will take that thought to its next natural step. That maybe we're a little closer to God than them. You can insert for yourself whoever them is. As a congregation, we have this temptation. We've had this thought in the history of our congregation. We've been here for 170 plus years. Certainly we can even read it in our council reports over all those years. We have had that temptation within us as a congregation that we are greater than them. Again, you pick. We are greater than them. We are closer to God than them. We are more loving than them. We are more inclusive than them. We are more welcoming than them. We are more compassionate than them. We are closer to the reflection of God's grace and God's mercy and God's love than them because we have borne witness to God at work in our lives. We know God's grace, God's forgiveness. We know what it means to be made right by God's love. This is what we proclaim through these waters and through this meal. It is only natural in our humanness, in our brokenness, in our sometimes selfishness, that we are then going to take that thought and claim God's grace for ourselves and maybe even use it as a comparative statement between ourselves and our neighbors. The disciples are debating their greatness because they have experienced greatness. They have experienced the very glory and presence of God in their midst. It seems almost natural and right that if we know that God is with us, Can God be with our neighbors? Can God be with the vulnerable, the sick, those in our midst? Maybe God is a little closer to us. 
From there, Jesus and his followers went through Galilee, and Jesus immediately tells the disciples, by the way, I'm about to be arrested, and I'm going to die, and on the third day, I will rise up. Now, you and I have 2,000 years of Easter's. We have 2,000 years of theology, 2,000 years of grandmas and grandpas, aunties and uncles, pastors and worship and music. We kind of have a sense of what Easter is, even though it doesn't make sense to us. The disciples have heard this already, still doesn't make sense to them, the way it doesn't make sense to us. And when they hear that, they are terrified of Jesus. In our small catechisms, we Lutherans, I know you read yours every day, I read mine every day as well, we all say with a smirk. But in our small catechisms that frame the way that we gather together in small ways, Luther tells us that we are called on to fear and love the Lord. Well, we get the love part, that makes sense. We give thanks for grace and forgiveness and redemption, all the words that we bounce around this space, but we are also called on to fear God, to be terrified in some sense of God. The disciples know that when they were up on that mountain, or at least when Peter, James, and John were up on that mountain, not only are they getting the divine revelation of God's nearness, but they're now realizing how close they are to God. And that is terrifying. God who can speak life with a breath. God who can bring forth the forces of, of nature that we can't even comprehend. The cosmos itself with a look, with a glance, with a cloud. And Jesus is reminding the disciples, as Jesus reminds you and I, that as we are near to Christ and as Christ is near to us, the way that we come to know that nearness, the way that we have come to know that grace and forgiveness is only through death. Which in and of itself is a little terrifying because it is not the glory that we envision. It is not the greatness of that we hope for. It's not the elevation and the comparative statements that we live in in our daily lives. The only way to experience the greatness of God, to know the grace of God, to know the forgiveness of God, is to confess our sins and recognize our brokenness in God's presence. It is Jesus who is claiming the disciples. The way Jesus claims you and I through these waters, through this meal, Jesus takes on our temptation, our very human nature, to want to make it about ourselves, to want to make it about how good we are, how close we are to God. That very thought that crosses our minds, that's what Jesus claims. And that is what Jesus is destroying on the cross so that we can be set free, so that we can be liberated of our sin, our temptation, the traps we set for ourselves so that we can bear witness to God's love at work in our lives. Of course, we want to be great. The very human thing within us is we want to be great. I want my families to be great. I want my kids to be great. I want this church to be great, to be a living reflection of God's kingdom in this space, to reflect the kingdom, the, the greatness of the kingdom of God throughout this community across the planet. And at the same time, in our human temptation, we elevate our need for greatness, and Christ claims that and sets us free. When we are near to Christ, we are standing at the foot of the cross. We are recognizing our brokenness. We are recognizing every temptation that keeps pulling us away from God, and it is Christ through the cross who keeps pulling us near to God. It is Christ who makes us right. It is Christ who sets us free. It is Christ who helps us to bear witness to our neighbors, our coworkers, our classmates, that the rightness that we have been washed in is not an elevation, but it is an opportunity to proclaim God's greatness and nearness in this world, in every home, in every street, in every school, in every space where we go. The disciples are terrified for what they may lose, and they are terrified for being in the greatness of God. And at that same breath, they have borne witness, and they will bear witness again, the way that you and I bear witness, sometimes if we're lucky, on a daily basis, when the hair goes up on the back of our necks, or maybe our, our, our arms tingle a bit, when we know that God is near that we have been redeemed, we have been renewed, we have been claimed, we have been forgiven, we have been and forever will be loved. This good news is greatness. And this good news is a gift that you and I, just like the disciples, have the opportunity to proclaim and to give away 
throughout these walls and these streets. Amen.